Good morning, everybody. It is a great morning. A lot of sunshine out there. It's good to be here with you uh, again. So let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you. You are a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful Father. Uh, you take care of us, Lord. You, you run before us and uh, you protect us. And uh, Lord, we are, are just <clears throat> amazed at your goodness and your mercy. So, Father, once again, we ask you to be with this service. May your words be put forth and not the messenger. And may you bore deep into our hearts, God, and uh, help us see you more clearly. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I hope you have your song sheets available, otherwise known as your email. <clears throat>
this is one for uh, how can I put this? This is this is one for all of us down home people. Great message, happy message. Primarily three chords, my favorite. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. There's a land that is fair. singing that one. That was good. <laughs> Out of the screen. <laughs> Back into the screen. It's good to be with you. Hope you're having a great morning. Um, so, I felt we were going through Luke a little too quickly. So we're going to go back to chapter one and start over, if that's okay with you guys. Amen! <laughs> <laughs> You know when you have church in different places, you never know what you're going to get, by the way. So uh, we are actually going to look at chapter 1 and chapter 2 a little bit, but it has everything to do with chapter 22 and 23 of Luke. But I thought you might appreciate the fact that we haven't spent a lot of time in Luke. <clears throat> Maybe we need to go back and look at it. So last week, we explored the breadth and the depth of what Christ accomplished on the cross, and actually through His death. And we read in the Gospels that the veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. And this was the first time the Holy of Holies was made accessible to anyone other than the high priest. It was just a, a, a very mysterious place to a lot of folks back then. Um, they, they knew what was in there according to tradition, <clears throat> but they had really had not seen it other than the high priest. So in our reading of the 8th chapter of Hebrews last week, we were made aware of the significance of what Christ accomplished, especially to the Jewish people who were immersed in the traditions and customs of the law. So the reason it is worthy, I believe, to spend a few more minutes of our time this morning <clears throat> in these passages uh, uh, referenced off of Hebrews 8, uh, it, we, it'll help us understand the connection between the temple and Jesus long before he began his public ministry and the crucifixion. So as a reminder, the first tabernacle, uh, which was actually a tent, was an elaborate but smaller portable version of what would eventually be built in Jerusalem. And that which was built in Jerusalem was called Solomon's Temple. 
and the Ark of the Covenant was present, both in the tabernacle, the traveling tabernacle, and Solomon's temple. So what they were accustomed to in the wilderness, they just moved to a permanent location in Jerusalem called the Temple Mount, and they reproduced that only with, <clears throat> with grand scale and grand scale. And if you want to read about that more, read about David gathering all the finances at the end of his reign in order to store all those finances, save those finances so Solomon could build the temple. <clears throat> now, however, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 587 B.C. This was part of last week's lesson by Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And the next temple to be built was known as Herod's temple. However, that next temple was actually begun by two Jewish men who had the vision to reconstruct a temple for the sake of honoring God. And they had reconstructed something that was maybe a little bit modest, I don't know. But Herod came into power, and Herod was a scoundrel. <clears throat> and the way he wanted to show his power, and all, all of the leaders did this, is he wanted to build a temple that was the grandest temple ever built. So what Herod did is he went into that more modest temple that the Jewish people had built together, <clears throat> and he looked at that, and he began to reconstruct it. He began to remodel it. And most historians say there was really not much left of the old temple at all uh, by the time Herod got through with his construction. So it was a reconstruction of the more modest temple, and the work of rebuilding the temple, Herod's temple, which became Herod's temple, uh, began in 19 BC. <clears throat> and that was the 18th year of Herod's reign. And the work was started by leveling. We have technical difficulties right here. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Evidently the camera is tired of Luke also. <laughs> so this temple was, uh, it was a newer building erected on a broader base, and it was made much taller so that the white stone gleamed in the bright Palestinian sun and could be seen from miles away. So this was Herod's um, attempt to show the world that he was a great ruler. And actually, of course, the Jewish people benefited from that. So the building began, the, the reconstruction began with the holiest building in the temple called the Holy Place. But the Holy Place was divided in half, not quite half, so the Holy of Holies was there, and then the Holy Place. The Holy Place is where the priests gathered to perform their their tasks. The Holy of Holies was, of course, reserved for the high priest. So the rest of the temple was built outward from the holy place. And the further away each section or court was positioned from the holy and the holy of holies, the less stringent the demands on who could enter in. So the area closest to the holy place was <clears throat> an outside court set aside for the altar of burnt offering. So you have the holy place, which has the holy of holies in it. The next court out was an outside court, and it was reserved for the sacrificing of, uh, sacrificing of the uh, paschal lambs. Next to it was the court of the Israelites um, who came to watch the service. So temple, um, the court where they did the, uh, the sacrifices, and then another court where people could come and observe this. Beside that court was a court of women. And behind it was the court of the Gentiles. And around, all around the Temple Mount, beautiful marble porticos were constructed, columns. A wall surrounded the entire area, which was about 35 acres, of which a small portion remains to this day known as the Wailing Wall. So two large bridges then connected the temple with the city on the west, 
While the main part of Herod's rebuilding was completed before his death in 4 BC, began at 19 BC, while most of it was completed by the time he died 4 BC, the work went on for more than 60 years after that. Interesting. When Jesus visited the temple at the first Passover of his ministry, it was said that the place had by then been under construction for 46 years. So the work was not entirely finished until 63 AD. From 19 BC to 63 AD, the work was finally finished. Now, some of you who are familiar with biblical history recognize that's only seven years until it was destroyed again. So we have Jesus giving a prophecy while on his final trip into the temple. And they said, look at these beautiful temple. Look at these blocks. Aren't they gorgeous? He said, I'm, I'm telling you, they're going to be destroyed. Not one stone will be left in its place. And that was seven years later. So in 70 AD. So last week, we briefly mentioned the ark as well as other sacred artifacts. And we had mentioned that they were missing, that they had been missing. And they're still missing. So from the time Babylon destroyed Solomon's temple in 587 BC until the birth of Christ, those objects were missing. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last week. And when we, when we were on our way home, which isn't far <laughs> from where we are right now, Kim was looking things up on her phone. And, and so we started digging into this a little more. It's really fascinating. So you can blame her for going back to Luke 1 and 2 right now. So the question is, if the ark was missing, upon what did they sprinkle the blood for sacrifice? Well, according to the Mishnah, now the Mishnah is a not so fancy name for a written, for the very first written account of the oral traditions. So picture this, for a long time, the way the Jewish children and their children and their children were continually reminded of what God was doing, what he had been doing, was by sitting around campfires or sitting at the dinner table or in the temples, and they would repeat this oral tradition. It was not written down. So you can imagine the difficulties there. So someone decided we need to write down these oral traditions. In and of itself, it's kind of funny because then it was no longer an oral tradition. But when someone says the Mishnah, it was the first written account of everything that had been passed down for hundreds of years. So according to the Mishnah, the foundation stone of Solomon's temple, the one that was destroyed in 587, took the place of the Ark of the covenant upon the completion of Herod's temple. And the high priest put his censer on that foundation stone on the day of atonement, which means the day of sacrifice. And that's the day the high priest made his annual sin offering. So in a nutshell, people, if, if you like history, you're loving this. If not, just bear with me. In a nutshell, in the Holy of Holies of Herod's temple, the room was empty, but for the foundation stone that was salvaged from Solomon's temple following its destruction in 587 BC. Now, all of this information is background for our story this morning. Some of you will be encouraged that you are actually going to spend some time in our study in Luke to begin with, because sometimes we leave that study altogether. But we're in chapters 1 and 2. We'll get through it. Now, keeping in mind that all that we have been studying these past weeks, from the time Jesus first entered into Jerusalem, his triumphant entry, until his crucifixion <clears throat> and his death on the cross, five days. That's all it was. Five days. However, the temple was no stranger to Jesus. So in Luke, we read a prophecy that was proclaimed in the Holy of Holies, back in the day concerning John the Baptist that was centered upon the arrival of Jesus. 
So even though this prophecy does not mention Jesus by name, the very fact that there's a prophecy of the one who's going to proclaim the coming of Christ makes this a, a messianic prophecy. Luke 1, 5, uh, 5 says this, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, which is the lineage of the priests, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. They walked blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord. This may not be on your scripture sheet, these couple verses. Bear with me. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So while he was serving as priest before God, there appeared to him, in verse 11, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. What's the significance of this? Well, of course, he's John the Baptist. So this was a prophecy being fulfilled for John the Baptist, who is going to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. Now think about this just for a minute. Zechariah, by lot, by chance, is the one serving in the Holy of Holies. And Gabriel appears to him. And Gabriel's a lieutenant of the heavenly host. Your, and says this, your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Can I tell you believers, if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, our angels don't hear, uh, the angels do not hear our prayers. The Father in heaven hears our prayers through the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, you shall name him John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Who do you think maybe was rejoicing at the, at the birth of John the Baptist? Well, I think there were relatives rejoicing because Elizabeth said, I can't have children, which was one of the greatest insults in that culture. I think maybe even the angels were rejoicing because this is the beginning of Christ's mission. We read that Zechariah challenged the angel. I would probably be silly enough to do that. Luke 1, 18 says this, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. A general over the a host of heaven was sent to this man in the Holy of Holies that all there was was a foundation stone. And he has given this message. So we see here that Luke first makes a reference to Jesus through Zechariah while he was in the Holy of Holies and is confirmed by this prophecy by Zechariah. Verse 67 of Luke 1, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. And then we continue reading in Luke 2, beginning with verse 22, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, meaning Jesus, they brought Jesus to him, to Jerusalem, to present him to the Lord. We're going to skip to verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. I love this word, consolation. What that means is comforting. He was waiting for the comforting of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, 
Christ meaning anointed one, the Lord's anointed one. Now, this is fascinating to me. Uh, what an unusual, tender, and marvelous story this is. Uh, why would God, the Holy Spirit, make such an incredible promise to Simeon? The only answer I have is God's great love for Simeon. We have nothing in the record that showed that Simeon had said, Lord, I don't want to die before I see the Messiah. He may have said that, and it may just not be recorded. But we have nothing in the record that shows this was a, a spoken desire by Simeon. But God understood his heart. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was upon him. He understood his heart, so he answered the prayer that may not yet have been prayed. Consider that. He answered the prayer that perhaps might not yet have been made. And so tender. He says, um, why would... Um, <laughs> sorry, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. It's fascinating. I have a question for you. Do you believe that how we Christians live our lives has influence upon how God blesses us? Do you believe that how we live our lives as Christians has influence upon how God blesses us? I think that's a good question. By the way, that's a sermon in and of itself, and we won't take the time to do that. Maybe we'll do that, uh, you know, 30 years from now or something. But it's a very important thing to ask because some of us believe that because God is sovereign, that he ignores our behavior. And it doesn't affect him, nor does it affect our lives. So here are some scriptures for you to look up. Obedience affects long life. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. This should be on your scripture sheet. Protection. Ecclesiastes 8, 5. Gladness, Nehemiah 8, 13 through 17. This is how obedience affects us. Great peace, Psalm 119, 165. The assurance of salvation, Colossians 3, 3. Answers to prayer, 1 John 3, 22. The conscious presence of Christ, John 14, 21. Our obedience affects how God responds to us. So let's review. In verse 25 of the second chapter of Luke, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the comforting of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by, who? The Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in, who, the Spirit, into the temple. And when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, we're going to stop there. The more we read, the more we recognize that Simeon had a very intimate relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. We see that it was the Holy Spirit who brought this revelation to Simeon and that it was not necessarily something for which he had prayed. You know, it's, it's wonderful that God knows our hearts. And sometimes he just chooses to bless us. And so God chose to bless Simeon through the mandate of the law. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, we're going to stop there again. So we see this. The intent was to bless Simeon as he was in obedience to the custom of the law. Where can we expect to be most blessed? 
in rebellion, um, in apathy, in being a, a Christian, a sluggard Christian, where can we expect to experience more blessings from God in the process of obeying Him? So the short answer here is yes, our obedience or lack thereof can affect the blessings we receive. But God will bless who He chooses to bless and to what extent. Now we read how Simeon responded to this great honor. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Now can you begin to even imagine the joy and thrill of taking this baby into your arms and looking upon his face, knowing beyond doubt that you are holding the Son of God. Mary had the same experience. Joseph had the same experience. But here is Simeon, and he's in the Spirit. The Spirit brought him to the temple, and he's in obedience. And God says, take this boy and dedicate him to me. And he knew he was a Messiah. So in this moment, God the Father was receiving a blessing from Simeon, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, while presenting God the Son, who, uh, as he was fulfilling the law that this little boy would fulfill. The Trinity is there. And here is the blessing he offered in verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. So did, did Simeon understand this was Messiah? Absolutely. He said, this has been fulfilled now. Now I can depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon knew, and his father and his mother, Mary and Joseph, marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child, Jesus, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This was a glorious time in the temple. Now add to this, in verse 36, there was a prophetess there by the name of Anna, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. We're going to skip through. She was 84. Verse 38, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him, meaning Jesus, to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. These things took place in the women's court. Holy of Holies, Holy Place, Outer Court, Court of Israel, or some would say the Court of Men, and then the Women's Court. This all took place in the Women's Court. A few years later, Luke 2, 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom, and when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple. After three days, they found him in the temple. And this was most likely what is called Solomon's porch. According to Josephus, Solomon's porch was a double-columned porch on the east side of the temple near the court of the Gentiles. It was about 23 feet wide, and the columns were about 40 feet tall. And it says here, After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. We read that Mary and Joseph 
marveled at what was said about him. And now these people are amazed by what he is saying. He's answering questions. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great dis distress. Can I just put this into modern day language? What were you thinking? Don't you know we love you? We worry about you? How could you just stay behind and not tell anybody you were back here? You know what? I have a good mind to... And then luckily Joseph stopped because you can't spank God. But this is, this is just real life stuff. They were, they, were, they were frustrated with God. They were frustrated with their son. And at this time in the temple of Solomon Porch, he made a very blatant prophecy. Now get this, he's, be, he's being disciplined. And by the way, he submits to that discipline. But this is what he said. Why were you looking for me? Now if I'm a dad, I'm going, what do you mean? That's a stupid question. Why do you think I'm looking for you? We were concerned for you. He goes, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Capital, father's house. It was an incredibly blatant prophecy. Of course it was missed by everyone. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them in his obedience. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Now treasure is more than creating a, a scrapbook. There are certain things that parents treasure in their hearts that their children do. And Mary treasured these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor, favor with God and man. So the next time we read of a dramatic um, visit to the temple, Jesus clears the temple. So we see the first prophecy in the Holy of Holies concerning John the Baptist, which alludes to Jesus. We see that Jesus was dedicated in the court of women. And then we see that he went, he was teaching, listening and teaching on Solomon's porch at 12 or 13 years old. So now we have this. Jesus not only cleared the temple, he cleared the temple twice. First time, John uh, 2, 16. The second time, Luke 19, 46. This was also the time when Jesus taught in the temple, the one in Luke, which enraged the religious elites. And it was at this time he used a lady as a subject in one of his teachings known as the widow's might. So he was teaching in the women's court where he was dedicated about 11 years previous. More than 11 years. Now there's great irony here in that from his dedication through the time of his death on the cross... God the Son was present at the temple when the ark was absent. That which represented God in the Holy of Holies was lost, and God in the flesh was present. And then there's a dramatic moment in world history when the veil in the temple is torn from the top to the bottom, exposing the chamber known as the Holy of Holies. And this veil, weighing thousands of pounds, was heaped upon the floor. It didn't fold neatly, nor did it fold into a small thing about knee height. That veil, that, that veil would have been much taller than that, even if it was crumpled. So this was a sanctuary where only the high priest could enter. It was made of cedar and covered in gold, ceiling, floor, and walls. So if anybody had been in the holy place... When that veil fell, what did they not see? Well, they did not see two cherubim of olive wood, each 16 feet tall, and each having outspread wings of 16 feet span, so that since they stood side by side, the wings touched the wall on either side of the Holy of Holies, met in the center of the room. This would have been in Solomon's temple because it was absent after that. It had no windows and was considered the dwelling place of the name of God. 
If they had been in the holy place when this fell, they did not see those things. They did not see the Ark of the Covenant, within which was a tablet of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff that continued to bud, and manna. Nor did they see the mercy seat on top of the Ark of pure gold inside and out, nor did they see two golden cherubim at the ends of the ark facing each other while looking downward toward the ark, nor did they see their wings stretching out covering the cover. The whole structure was beaten out of one piece of pure gold. They didn't see any of those things. What they would have seen would have been a golden and empty room with a blood-stained block of stone prominently placed on the floor where the glory of Israel, the ark, once rested. A bit anticlimactic, right? There would have been no pillar of fire, nor smoke representing God's glory. That left with the ark. For hundreds of years, the glory of God was missing from the Holy of Holies. And yet the priests faithfully carried out the ritual of the sin, of the sin offering, I'm sorry, once a year. So as Jesus said to his family, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, as Jesus and his family attended the Passover every year, and as Jesus was dedicated in the women's court, and as Jesus listened and debated on Solomon's porch, and as Jesus was clearing the temple twice, and as Jesus entered the temple during the triumphal entry, and as Jesus re-entered the women's court and taught about the widow's might, and as Jesus was dragged into Caiaphas's court and scourged, and as Jesus was marched from Caiaphas to Pilate to Herod and back to Pilate, and as Jesus was nailed to the cross, and as Jesus took himself uh, took upon himself our sin and thus the wrath of God for three hours and as Jesus was dying upon the cross and breathing his last breath the holy of holies was empty it was nothing more than a grand majestic shrine that had been that had outlived its usefulness and significance the people, however, were fully committed to this celebration of Passover and the rituals that surrounded it. And dare I say, even the superstitions that continued to propagate the mystery of what they thought was behind the curtain. So just a reminder, keep in mind that there had been over 400 years years of silence from God following the destruction of Solomon's temple. And that lasted until the birth of Christ. God had not spoken one time during those years. He spoke in the temple through Zechariah concerning John the Baptist and he spoke through Simeon as he was offering a blessing to God when Jesus was a little over a month old. So from 587 until Herod began the reconstruction of his temple in 19 BC, they had had no temple. And they had not heard from God. It's called the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus would not have been permitted into the holy place of the temple or the holy of holies. He didn't have the credentials. While they were eagerly awaiting to hear the voice of God the Father for over 400 years, they were deaf to the voice of God the Son as He shared the incredible message of grace. As God the Son, the perfect substitutionary Lamb, died on the cross, the holiest place on all of the earth became irrelevant and was destroyed seven years later by God. That symbol, that symbol of the Old Covenant had to be destroyed. So, where is the modern day church in this story? Where do we fit? Well, it really does not take much thought to identify some of the similarities. There are many majestic and glorious shrines 
built in the name of God, who never have or no longer preach the gospel of Christ. There are many who have more faith in the rituals and laws of the church than they have in Christ. Things like you can't move the communion table. It hasn't been moved in 37 years, which might explain how dirty the carpet is underneath. You have to speak, uh, speak from a pulpit. I like pulpits, actually. Someday I'll get one, maybe. But there are many who have more faith in the rituals and laws of the church than they have in Christ. And yes, there are many evangelical believers who limit the role of the Holy Spirit to a lesser role than God the Father or God the Son. Who was with Simeon? Who communicated to Simeon? The Holy Spirit. And of course, the ultimate question this morning is this. Are you an empty shrine? with all the entrapments of religion? Or have you received Jesus Christ and experiencing the fullness of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? You know, throughout my life, I've probably been both of these a number of times. And the truth is, when it comes to our flesh, the rituals and laws are more comfortable for us. Because when we're doing well, we really feel good about ourselves, and that last word is the problem. We shouldn't be feeling good about ourselves. We should be praising God for what He's doing through us and saving us and through His mercy and grace. But when we begin to do badly, we get angry with God. Because we feel the conviction. We understand the conviction. So are you an empty shrine with the entrapments of religion? If so, you're probably exhausted. Because you just can't keep up with what God demands. Jesus kept up with what God demanded through his blood. So if you are looking for a time and a place... to have peace and life it's not in going to church it's through the love and the blood of Jesus Christ now do we believe church is important well of course we do or we wouldn't be doing this but that's out of our love for God it's out of our love for one another and our de desire to serve one another. So we leave you with this message, and we hope, we hope it pricked your heart. The way you receive Jesus is very simple. I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. And I finally recognize that God is who He says He is. And I believe that Jesus is who He says He is. And I believe that I need to receive him if I want any kind of life different than what I have. But be prepared. Be prepared. As God gave his all through his son, he demands all of us. But he's a great father.
good, good Father, you are tender, you are wonderful, you are steady, you are consistent, you love us, you discipline us, you are holy, you are perfect, we are imperfect, but for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray this. If there's one who is watching that has heard the gospel so many times, and they've said no all of those times, will you help them understand that they will not always be given the opportunity in the future. So may they receive you now. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. What a glorious morning. Thank you. Hope to see some of you very soon.